Good morning to everybody in Riverside. Good morning. I am indeed Philip, Philip Melanto. I just got in from Germany a couple days ago. And I have heard for years about Riverside, in fact, a little bit about Pine Grove, a little bit about Bethesda. And so I was really happy to get invited and to be able to come. Come here and have a beautiful church, great congregation, great pastor. So I and I've already felt welcome being here. So anyway, we're glad we could come. I had several occupations. I served as a, 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 a I served as a minister, a, a theologian, and a university professor. I was born a long time ago, of course, in Western G G Germany in 1497. That's about 500 years ago or so. As a young child, I, 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 I excelled in school. And so I was allowed to enter the Heidelberg University at age 13. In fact, at age 17, I got my master's degree. I was hailed as a wonder kid. And I was made professor of theology at the new Wittenberg University at a very early age. I, 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 I married my wife, Catherine. We had several children. And I believed that our home was like a little church. We lost one of our sons at age two. And then my sister-in-law and brother died as well. So we adopted their children. As you can tell, I'm afflicted with a certain thorn in the flesh, a stuttering which as a professor and a lay preacher, well, there's a little bit of a problem. It kept me humble, kept me sympathetic to others. But in spite of this, my, teach, my preaching style and teaching style has kind of become a standard for the methodical style of preaching. At the university, I was often consulted as an expert on theological issues by many learned academics including Dr. Martin Luther. Our reform movement, or reformation, but our reform movement began with the university community. And we worked, and as a result, one of our Lutheran traditions is the pursuit of scholastics and higher education. Dr. Luther, he introduced me to this reformed theology idea that he had. And I urged him to go to the very source and learn the original language of the New Testament, which of course was in Greek. So I taught him Greek and he learned it. With his mastery of the language, I then urged him to translate the Bible into the German language for the common folks. During all this, he persuaded me to join this Reformation movement and to fight to bring biblical restoration to the church. I worried a lot about the community's welfare, hoping the church could have the freedom and the safety that it needed to develop all of this in a peaceful and logical manner. Together, Martin and I agreed we were, we are, intellectual equals. In this partnership that we developed, which was hopefully to develop all of this in a peaceful nature, but this partnership, we became the founders of the Lutheran Church. Of course, along with the support of many other people too. And we influenced each other profoundly for the gospel. Uh, and during this, we became very close and deep friends. So close was this partnership with the gospel that, in fact, I would rather have died 
them to be separated from Martin all those years. As a reformer, along with Martin, I was called on to write many defining documents for this new reforming church that was developing. One of those was a book called The Augsburg Confession, which I forgot to bring up. What I got there yesterday to the parsonage, just coming from Germany, I walked into the parsonage, the pastor was busy, so I went and looked around his office, and lo and behold, I see this book. 500 years ago, I wrote it. So I picked it up just to see if anybody had ever looked at it, and I find there are underlinings all over in here. There are stick'em notes. And you have to remember 500 years ago we didn't call them stick'em notes. <laughs> but the book that I wrote is still being used today by our pastor, and my pastor's all over. And it's called the Augsburg Confession. I worked tireless, tirelessly in many of the churches and in many universities to bring about reform that was based on this book. Not to brag, but my day began pretty early, usually about 2 o'clock in the morning, and continued until 8 or 9 at night. I believe, for example, that the authority of Christ Church is not held exclusively by just the pastor or the priest or the bishops, but it's held by everyone, including those. I publicly denounced, and of course Martin Luther did too, I publicly denounced the false teaching that the church was doing on justification from sin by works and penance. Penance meaning the giving of money for something. So I publicly denounced what was going on, this justification from sin by works and paying for, which we didn't believe was right. It wasn't what the original church and what the Bible offered or taught. Good works and penance, paying for something, they can never offer forgiveness or the assurance of salvation. Which just isn't possible. Let me say that once again. Good works and penance cannot give you salvation, the assurance of going to heaven. So on the topic of law and gospel, I was the one who made the distinction between those two, and it became the central formula of our Lutheran faith. I believe that the law is part of God's word, found in the Bible, and it condemns us in our judgment of sin, for our sins. God's law removes all hope we might put in ourselves and our efforts at being able to get to heaven or to be forgiven. I believe the gospel is God's promise of forgiveness that tells us though we are sinners and deserving only a harsh plan, harsh judgment, but that Jesus died on the cross taking our suffering for our punishment and judgment. The gospel means we are saved by the free gift of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. <clears throat> Let me repeat that because that also is one of the main efforts of this reform movement that Martin Luther and I were part of. The gospel means we are saved by the free gift of God's grace through faith in Jesus. I introduce the belief that to be justified from our sins, that we are accounted as just, meaning that we are not actually without sin, but that God, because of Jesus' death, considers us to be sinners. I have to make a few comments about Martin Luther. You might think of him as being negative, but that's not the purpose of my saying him. 
Martin is a very strong, brash man. Tall, big, big voice. I, on the other hand, was more organized, a little quieter, but kept everything going. The two of us made a grand pair, a good pair, but we were different. He wasn't always able to see the forest because of the trees, but his work was not, and his work wasn't always really unified. So I created an organized overview of this whole project, and it became the first systematic theology of Reformation and provides the right understanding of the scripture's meaning in our Christian faith. In this systematic theology I wrote and unified our different many doctrines and teachings on so many topics and together and showed how every one of our beliefs related to each other. I had several jobs within our reform movement. I served as a church diplomat. I was a representative from the government of Saxony. And I was on the official board of the government of the Holy Roman Empire. For this, both Martin and I were attacked vigorously by those, of course, who didn't believe the way in what we were trying to promote. Martin was excommunicated from the church, and there was a death warrant issued for him, even though he committed no murder. So during this time and afterwards, I did a lot of the traveling for him. I defended our movement and defended him and uh, carried on. My nature, as you probably have discovered, was much more subdued than his. Martin, on the other hand, well, he was so bold. He was outspoken, incredibly so. In fact, it seems like he spread sparks wherever he went. Not that that was bad. It was what was needed in this great turmoil in the Reformation. And the idiotic resistance that we had to refute. Did I just say the word idiotic? A crazy, strong, uh, it was, it, it wasn't good, it was really bad, it was very, it, it was a difficult time during the church and what the reform movement was to bring forward and to make all these changes. So there were people that called us idiots. We had to fight, like I say, we fought the devil, <laughs> we fought the rebels, we both managed to bring rage to the devil and his crowd of followers. And sometimes they were unreasonable, they were blind to the truth. In fact, they were blind to God and the Bible sometimes. Martin prepared the way for this Reformation very well. He plowed the road, so to speak, but it was rough. I came along, smoothed it out some, worked with him, and together, this Reformation movement continued to move forward. I spent a lot of time defending him. I championed the cause. And, of course, there were a lot of debates, a lot of negotiations. <clears throat> My caution and the moderation that I exhibited worked well to gain the sympathy of the education community. I argued that we stood against and firmly rejected only the church's practices that didn't fit with the Bible. We weren't against the whole church. We were basically against how you got to heaven. Church leaders, of course, <laughs> tempted me to leave the church to leave this cause, but needless to say, neither of us did. I believe that in the greater church community, we can work together on projects, even though we may see minor things differently. That's true today, too. At the time of my friend's death, I was forced into a greater position of leadership and became the theological leader of the whole Reformation movement. <clears throat> I undertook to write a volume of books, 
some commentaries on the New Testament. In fact, they became the Wittenberg Commentaries, it's called then and today. And that still helps pastors with sermon preparation and in their methods of teaching. <coughs> in this pro excuse me. <coughs> in this process, I managed to create a certain way and a practice of to use in digging deep into the treasures of the Bible. My commentaries became the first Protestant created method for theological study. It was a busy, demanding life with academic pursuits, seeking to rediscover the faith of the church's founders, of course, who were the apostles and the prophets, along with Jesus Christ himself. In addition to the work in the church, I became a leader in higher education, in a whole reform movement on that, and its further development. In 1524, I began setting up the first public schools. I helped reorganize universities and helped develop new teaching and learning techniques, as well as writing a countless number of textbooks. I was a very influential designer of our educational system I laid the groundwork for the rise of religious higher education as well. I had served our Lord Jesus faithfully. I cared for the needs of the church with great devotion and steadfastness for during my life of about 63 years. It was on one of my missionary journeys into Leipzig, Germany in the year 1560 that I fell ill real bad with the fever, cold, flu, whatever you want to call it. I was not well. I kind of figured my life was coming to an end and I was really concerned yet about the state of the church. You know, was it going to make it? Was the reform movement going to succeed and uh, continue? I continued my teaching responsibilities up until April 9th, when I could hardly get into the classroom anymore. In fact, the last day I lectured 15 minutes on atonement and the reconciliation of God that was won on the cross for us all. In those final days, I found untold strength in continuous, continuous prayer and having the Holy Scriptures read to me because I couldn't read them myself anymore. In fact, right at the end, my son-in-law asked me if there was anything I needed. But this was while I was really on my deathbed. And all I could say to him was, Heaven. Ten, day, ten days later, my earthly life came to an end, and I was laid to rest next to my dearest and best friend, Martin Luther. Regarding my life, I can only say that I ask not to live happily necessarily, but righteously and Christ-like. Now I know all this sounds like I came to you and I've been bragging. My intent wasn't to come and brag about what Philip done during his life and in the reform movement, but to bring some knowledge to you. I was a part of it. I mean, nobody ever seems to acknowledge me, do they? <laughs> All we hear about is Martin Luther. And there were others, too, that helped develop the reform movement. And bringing back to, coming back to a more modern time, I Googled last night Philip's thing on the internet. And up comes all kinds of data on this man. Textbooks, things he has done. He was 14 years younger in age than, uh, than uh, Martin Luther. So uh, it's just interesting. So I was glad to be invited to come here to tell about myself a little bit. I hope you take it in the right spirit. And I know that the Reformation movement was strong. We have the Lutheran Church and all the things we believe in, and that our take on salvation is the right one. Thank you for your time this morning.